Um, the key phrase is structured wiring. That is a thing, uh, you know, a phrase we use in the industry. Um, you know, we have a lot of wiring. In fact, I would say a successful, uh, you know, telephone switchboard or PBX installation or a data installation is really mostly about wire management. Uh, the phrase I like to use is wiring hygiene. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of it. So keeping the cost and particularly the labor component cost down. I'm going to have some fun with Pat because, uh, you know, I've worked with him forever in the communications business also, and he's, he's very good natured about it. But, um, you know, the good news is this, this isn't complex. It can't be because as Phil said, you know, phone men have to do it. There's a reason um, I deal with fiber optics now instead of copper. That, that's right, because you can put that where the, sh the sun doesn't shine. Um, you got it. <laughs> they call that an endoscope, but that's basically Pat just doing his job in the normal way. Um, so uh, uh, what is it BBC says? The main points. It's ubiquitous. You can find communications cable anywhere. Uh, it's inexpensive. Uh, I was just looking at Amazon last night, and I saw a 1,000 feet of Cat5 for as little as uh, four and a half cents a foot. Um, 25 pair, which is heavier duty, can be used for consolidation. Uh, originally, it was used for office telephones back in the days of buttons and hold. Um, but uh, it's still good for trunking, running you know a bunch of cables back to a, a central backboard. Um, and it's still pretty cheap, a buck a foot. Uh, with connectors considerably less without. Also, this stuff is really rugged. So if you're a scavenger, uh, you know, or one of those clever guys like Mike O'Dorney who always seems to be there when somebody's getting rid of something useful, um, you know, you can pull this stuff back out. You know, uh, the, the telephone guy who's wrecking it out was just going to take that copper over to the scrap place and uh, sell it for scrap and get some money to fund the, uh, the cutover party. Uh, if you get there first, you know, 20 bucks will get you all the Cat5 you could ever need. Because um, all they really wanted was a case of beer. Um, uh, so Cat5 is also available. That's your, your, four your four pair or eight conductor wire, connectorized or unconnectorized, so bulk or with connectors. Many styles of jacks. Uh, are available. So you can always find an easy way to make a pre-connectorized scheme. Uh, we'll talk more about handy adapters. Uh, and once again, it's all about wiring hygiene. And uh, here I am reading the slide at you, but uh, these are, you know, the key points. Just one quick comment before you leave that. One, one interesting thing about bulk cables, you can buy 10 three-foot Cat5 cables on eBay for five, seven bucks, something like it. They're cheap. Yeah, absolutely. The, the really cool thing is you buy three foot cables. Those are actually 20 foot and a half termination cables. You just cut them in half, strip them, get the connectors out. You now have a cable on one end. The other end is ideal to go into any sort of little terminal blocks or to solder onto something or anything. And you now have just containers. And by the way, that wire can be a foot and a half, or you can buy 30 foot cables and cut them in half and have two 15s. So, you know, yeah. if you've got to run, it, it's really interesting. You can buy this stuff and chop it up and it becomes really functional and it's designed in a way that it makes it really cheap to have stuff. So in other words, if you've got to make a whole bunch of cables to run from your panel out and you've decided to use an RJ45 jack at the end, instead of putting a, you know, instead of putting 200 RJ45 jacks on, buy a hundred foot cables and cut them in half and you never do jack work again. And if you, decide, if you need a plug, the, uh, the plugs and the tools are, again, available in any big box okay. store and inexpensive. So, um, you know, if you need them on Sunday afternoon, it's not a problem. If you can plan ahead and buy them from eBay or Amazon, they're really cheap. Um, so, the cables uh, are generally 22, 26 gauge. So they're actually really good for signaling wiring over over distance. You won't get voltage drop or anything at the voltages we're running at. Boy, you're talking over my slides, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. All kinds of cool stuff. Um, just to give you an idea, if you aren't familiar with this stuff, 
Um, and I, actually, I borrowed a few of these from Phil's presentation, but you can get patch panels. They typically bring all eight wires full through so you can move things around. I mean, that may be important in a modular or sectional layout, which, uh, you know, is subject to being rearranged. Um, it's handy for troubleshooting. Um, if you think something is bad, you just unplug it and see if the problem follows the cable or, you know, stays there. Uh, so it makes for easy debugging. Uh, the jacks down in the lower left are, uh, there's all sorts of holders for them, including, you know, your traditional, um, you know, wall jack, like you would have uh, next to, a, a, you know, your two power plugs coming out. It's that style of connector. And those are available in one, two, four, eight, maybe more. Uh, I've got a couple on my site, the guys in the middle. These are adapters that go from RJ45 to uh, classic chub boards to terminal strips. Uh, uh, some of them have places to put resistors. So if you're driving signals, you don't have to worry about space wiring the little limiting resistors. There's a good solid place to solder them down. Um, and then, um, you know, as Phil was saying earlier, you can just bring them back, you know, connectorized one end and punch them down on the classic connect uh, punch block. Now then the punch blocks themselves, and in fact, you can see on this one, if you look on the upper left, there's a little red thing with a black tab sticking out. The black tab is actually a piece of Velcro that can be pulled tight over a 25 pair connector to plug it in. So once again, you can just lay your cable in place, then uh, plug it into the punch block. You can do your wiring completely you're, you're cross-connecting completely independent of whether the cable's there or not. Uh, I implemented this in uh, some uh, office telephone systems back in the late 70s at a company I was working for, and uh, this technique, you know, knocked 75% of the labor out. You know, some of the crew weren't totally thrilled about that, but uh, uh, boy, you know, we had been at the customer's premises in the way, racking up labor bills. Uh, from cutover, you know, from Monday morning to Thursday afternoon, we needed to pull off and start wiring the next job. I had guys out of there by 11 in the morning on Monday after going to this technique. So it really helps with your consistency. Um, um, and, uh, and, and Pat as a union guy doesn't approve of that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so all sorts of other things, uh, and I, you know, if you want to look a little closer, I can pick up the camera later and show you these. But uh, in the upper left, there's a little um, plug that you, uh, you can see that little green Phoenix connector, it has screw terminals on it, so you can actually just fuel terminate with screw terminals. Uh, the one in the upper right is one of my favorites, and this really speaks to Phil's issue about, I want to use a, a a tortoise. So what you've got on the left there is a Solens connector, which actually fits on the tortoise properly and stays in place. Um, they're a little expensive, um, but uh, now you've got uh, an RJ45 on the other end, on the other end, and all those little squarish pads or rectangular pads are for resistors. So if you want to use one of the contacts for um, a switch position indicator, like the one Earl was showing in staging, where it was kind of hard to see on the upper level which way the switch was thrown, you can put your resistors right on the board and you don't have, you know, space wired kludges everywhere. Uh, Phil was talking about the cheapness of patch cables. So look at the lower left, that six pack was on Amazon. I think those are three foot cable or one meter cable. And I think it was all a 459 for the six. And they're all different colors, so you can color code them. You know, green for the tortoises, right? And maybe red for the signals, whatever you want. Uh, fascia panels may be yellow. Um, uh, there are some specialized tools, but the little kit over on the right was under 50 bucks on eBay. It includes the crimper, includes a punch tool, the gray guy in the bottom middle, a couple of strippers in the lower right, uh, a cable tester, so you can check that your cable's good if maybe you think that's the problem and a starter kit of connectors and a little wallet to put the whole thing. Seth, I, I need you to be really clear there. We're not implying that you get a stripper for 50 bucks. It's well, you know, uh, there, there's no pull, that's extra. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, if you look in the upper level of one of Ted's structures, you might find one. 
Um, but you know, compared to the tools that we buy, these are actually really inexpensive and, and they'll last forever tools uh, they, as a toolkit. Absolutely. And as model railroaders, I mean, who could turn down the opportunity to buy another tool? You know, it's, it's not something we do. Um, uh, so, okay, so the, the, the benefit statement here, you know, and I've kind of buried the lead, is because you can now plug everything in. It means anything that needs to be assembled or soldered, like the resistors for, for the signals, that can all be done on the bench, you know, right side up, uh, the solder falling down and not in your face. Uh, and you can pre-assemble and pre-test everything. And that kind of goes back to my uh, key telephone system installers back in the 70s. You know, much, much less uh, to be debugged in the field, which means it goes way faster. Um, it's easy to rearrange your test wiring. Um, we talked about colored patch cables. Uh, there's lots of ways to consolidate it. Um, you can see this thing here that looks like a cat of nine tails. It's a bunch of uh, RJ45s being consolidated into a 25 pair. Um, you can get these things and then the other side is something that looks like a big harmonica, which is a whole set of jacks that, you know, then plug into a 25 pair cable. So you can manage this instead of even in the worst case, you have one piece of Cat5 rather than eight wires running around that each have to be color-coded and labeled. You, you do label and document what you did, right? Um, so even if you don't, I mean, how many tortoises are out there? Look for the green cable that's going to the right area. Um, a good deal of phone cabling is, is documented more because every pair of wires, every position has a particular meaning. Um, so, you know, you do this for a while, I mean, I ran telephone installers for, you know, five or ten years early in my career was kind of a big part of my job responsibilities. You can just read this, you can look at that pair and know what number it is, what color it is, what's probably on it, um, you know, and it, it's very nice because it is structured and everything does have a purpose. Um, what's next? Ah, RJ45s, dirty little secret. There's two styles. Um, I'm, I, I never quite understood why the 568A never caught on, but everybody uses the 568B. Um, it's the one with the, and I'll put these slides up, uh, I'll talk to Phil and we'll put them on a PDF and you can have them. Um, this is, uh, you know, the data color code. Uh, it's directly related to the old phone color code. And I've got another chart here that talks about that. Um, you probably will only be worrying about this in the case that you've got connector at one end and uh, a bare wire at the other, or you're just applying a connector yourself. But it's pretty simple. The wires, each pair, the orange and the orange stripe are paired up. So, you know, really it's only four things to worry about. You just you know, handle the pairs together. Um, but Seth, the green ones aren't paired together. Oh, well, actually the blue ones are in the middle. Well, it depends on how it's done. In, in, in telephony, you know, voice, the, the white pair was together. Um, the, or the white green, I'm sorry, the white blue pair was together, then the orange was around that, then green was on one side and brown on the other. So there's a couple of styles of doing this. And if you look, the data guys actually don't use the blue and orange pair. They are, no, they don't use the blue and brown pair. The blue is, you know, always considered the voice pair so that you could, in the early days, there was the thought that you would run uh, voice in the same sheath. And Seth, um, that's a, that's a real, there's a really good point here for people as you get into this. If you go back one slide, that thing at the bottom left, you have to be really careful with that because it only is two pairs to each of those RJ45s over. So it's a 50 pin, it's a 25 pin connector on the left. It's a big connector. If you look at the math on that, you have more pairs coming from 12, four pairs. That's 48 pairs going into 24. The reason it works is it actually only takes the two data pairs right. out of each of those connectors. So. I haven't worked through how to do this and said it's an interesting thought process, but 
if you think about a, if you think about a switch, there really is only two or four wires you need from a tortoise that run back the control. Probably a couple more are for the local frog, so they really don't need to go back. So there's an interesting thought about how you could use that in some of these systems. But it, just one thing, as you look at this wiring, what what Seth just said about only two pairs are used in data is really important because a lot of these devices actually take advantage of that. Um, for example, if you do modular and they have these three-way um, Cat5 RJ45 splitters that are used by some of the people on their control bus, there actually are two types of those. There's one type that's wired with eight pairs all eight wires to both all three ports and that's a true splitter but then there's another one where it takes two wires from here and runs them this way and across and two wires this way and those actually will not work for the cab control buses on like mrc or, or those because they're wired differently so that's the one caveat on this what seth said is really important if you start getting weirdness in the things you bought check that maybe you have something that's just wired for the two pairs for data because that'll screw it up if you planned on using all four pairs. For example, I, what I showed last week where I wired the tortoises, all four pairs are used in that. And if you use the wrong cable connector, you only get two pairs through it. Anyway, enough said, thanks. <laughs> no, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Um, and by the way, there's, there's the six conductor version of this cat and nine tails affair also, if you really need all eight. But uh, you know, Phil raises a good point. We have this joke in the communications industry. It's uh, we love standards. We have lots of them. Pick one. Um, so, um, uh, but this stuff is so convenient that people have repurposed it. So there's a couple of different flavors. And and I'll just make an offer. If if you're interested in implementing one of these kinds of structured wiring plans, then you, so feel free to reach out to me. And I'm sure Phil and we'll be happy to walk you through this and find you a set of stuff that actually plays together. Um, okay, so we kind of talked about the, uh, the, the two flavors. Um, uh, here's an example where uh, using a tortoise, now actually uh, you can cut the pads on the adapter to use a contact for the frog locally. This is something Phil just addressed. Usually, uh, unless you're completely in the electro in in the uh, insole frog uh, dead rail or not dead rail but keep alive world, you're going to want uh, to switch the frogs. And even then, with small wheelbases, maybe you're going to want to switch the frogs. So you can you can uh, just grab one of the contacts, and uh, I, I've got them labeled one and two. And you've got the common and the normally open and the normally closed. So that way you can drive a, a, a frog or a, you know, use the other one to drive a switch position indicator. Um, this color code is the old voice version, which I've always used. But notice that the outer two contacts on the uh, tortoise up there um, are actually split between the brown and uh, the white orange uh, pair. So there's lots of ways, you know, to, to wire these. Um, pairing is more important if you have a balance signal like voice, but for just running a motor, it doesn't matter at all. And you can split the pairs uh, in any imaginable model railroad application. Uh, let's see. Uh, so again, you know, one thing we did on this board is provided a place to break out the uh, the leads to insert resistors in line. Uh, you might have gathered by now that one of my pet peeves is space wired resistors dangling under the layout, getting tangled in everything else, and anybody crawling under the layout to do maintenance. Um, so this is a nice scheme for doing tortoise wiring. Uh, and it's functionally equivalent to what Phil had last week which was just built with a keystone jack doing effectively the same thing. And quite frankly, I'd never seen these. And, and between us, I, I didn't know you made these, Seth. For my modules, I probably would have chosen this if I hadn't had the other ones already built because it's a lot easier to well, put on. Well, if they're working, why change them? Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. But, but, you know, what's interesting, I think what Seth's saying here is if you go do this, when you decide to use it for your, your whatever switches you use, whether it's tortoise or whatever system it is, go ahead and establish a standard for how that's going to be terminated. And then if you follow that, everything on the layout's always the same. Right, exactly. And so it's effectively self-documenting. You can 
figure out what it's doing just by looking at it. Beauty, the beauty of this is if you look at, at individual wiring, you got all these wires running out there and they don't tend to get bundled up. One of the beauties of Cat5 is you get this natural bundling of four pairs, which is really eight wires. Because if you think about it in signaling, you don't use the pairs for plus and minus because you can have a common to save a lot of wiring. So the eight wires in a pair actually can be, you can use two pairs to have 16 wires, one ground and 15 signaling wires running out to a location where you have an interlock. And once you've established that as a standard, all you have to do is label that at either ends with the identifier number of the interlock. And everything inside those pairs, where they go, is all predefined by a standard. Right? The, right. the, beauty, the bundling, it turns out the bundling makes numbering and identifying wiring really easy just by the natural bundling that's built into the physical aspect of the way the cables are. And th that's kind of why this stuff all got built that way because it naturally makes you do things in structured ways which are easy to document by the physical design of the system. Anyway, go. No, no, you're quite right. I mean, the key here again is wiring hygiene. You know, keep the stuff clean, keep it uniform, then it's always clear what it is. Here's another signal uh, wiring standard, one that I use because most of us model Western railroads and Western railroads use route signaling. And then you typically had one or two uh, heads on a signal. And if you did a, one end of a, a control point, for example, one end of an OS section, you'd have the entering signal with two heads. And again, what you see here is two sets of green, yellow, red, and a common, usually it's plus, but you know, on some older common cathode stuff, it'd be a common minus. Um, and that's a nice structured approach. Then you, know, you have a second cable running up to the uh, leaving signals on the main and the siding. Uh, once again, you know, the resistor pads mean you can concentrate all the resistors on the boards and you don't have to worry about them dangling down. Um, and you could make a similar standard for control panels, fascia panels, stuff like that. So once again, every time you come up to one of them, you maybe had the yellow cable for the fascia panel, the red uh, cable for the uh, signal, the green for the tortoise, and you know what they mean. Um, so again, this keeps it simple and, you know, simple-minded people like phone men can handle this pretty easily. Um, uh, consideration. Okay, uh, so generally this stuff is 24 gauge. Occasionally you'll see 22 or 26. Um, that works out to about 26 ohms per thousand feet or 272 ohms per loop mile. For most of our purposes, that's negligible resistance. So you don't really have to worry about it. Um, uh, you know, I'd be, I don't know that I've ever actually seen a run on a model railroad more than 150 feet. Um, you know, it, it's generally considered safe to run up to 600 milliamps through 24 gauge. So, you know, any reasonable load. The one suggestion is twin coils. I would suggest putting twin coil drivers close to the coils just because when the, when the motor throws and then the magnetic field collapses, it produces a pretty nasty spike. And the longer the wire driving it, the better an antenna you have to radiate that into every production. So um, there's lots more to do on that, and it's a different discussion. Um, like I said, on any practical layout, you know, the distance uh, and the current ca carrying capability are not going to be an issue. Um, the cables are twisted. Uh, this is a not just to keep them neat and together, although it has that benefit, and uh, uh, that's a really good reason to do it even if there was no other, but it does tend to reject noise uh, getting into the signal wiring, and it does tend to prevent the signals you're running through your cable from radiating. So if you're running anything that's big or relatively high frequency, uh, it's probably a good idea to keep both sides of the wire on the same pair and not split. Um, but that's, it, it doesn't happen a lot in model railroading. Again, um, feel free to reach out to one of us if you, uh, if you think you might have an issue there. Um, stranded wire, skin effect, all that stuff. I mean, you'll hear the audio guys talk about it. In my opinion, it's voodoo. 
uh, skin effect doesn't apply much below 500 megahertz. We're talking about, you know, DC, DC in ground, even DCC is 16 kilohertz. Uh, we're orders of magnitude lower frequency than any place that would matter. Um, so, so one, just one comment, Seth, because we've gone through a lot of discussion about frog power um, related to this stuff, and it's kind of a combination of the Cat Five and the tortoise. And so, one of the things that's really interesting, if you look at twenty-two gauge or twenty-four gauge wire, we always think about it as distance wire, but if you actually look at the standard, they have a panel current standard for twenty-two gauge wire, and I'm going to blow you away and say it's three and a half amps. Oh yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, words, are, so if you we think just about this up and find tables on the internet, right? So what I'm telling you is, if you're if you've got a Cat Five cable that's a foot long that's running from a tortoise over to whatever wherever your frog is, and you're running O scale, you can have a couple three a couple amps running through that wire for the time something's on the frog, no problem. Well, and consider. Fact, uh, Phil, I mean, 26 ohms per thousand foot. So what does that say? You know, dot o 26 ohms per foot. Right. I mean, well, well, I, I'm that's saying negligible. That. You're not going to have any voltage drop. Well, what I'm saying is that the first reaction we had when we started talking about this, people said, well, wait a second. What if we run the frog current for O-scale engines through the tortoise and a 22-gauge, 24-gauge wire? Aren't we going to have problems? And when we actually went through and looked at, A, the tortoises will handle about 5 amps, 6 amps, as long as they're not opening and closing the switch. And so if you look at that, you're fine there. And you look at the amount of engines that are on the frog, even if you've got a lash up, it's only one engine. And we came to the conclusion that you can be perfectly comfortable in OSCO where we pull eight amps on a lash up all the time. We're, we're pulling eight amps off of a DCC on a lash up. And we're comfortable running that through a frog where the frog is wired directly from the tortoise switch with 24 gauge wire. Because the current and the distance in that is all okay. So it's really interesting. We think about this as being small wire, but as long as your distances are short, you can actually use it for things that are fairly high current. Anyway, yeah. uh, interesting no, thought for us. That's absolutely valid. And that's, you know, part of the point I'm trying to make here, which is, you know, I use 24 gauge for, uh, uh, for feeders because they're only 18 inches long. So how much resistance am I adding? You know, you can't measure that with your ramp meter. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't lab equipment that might have a measurable distance, but it's nothing you would ever see in operation, especially on an HORN scale layout. So this stuff is perfectly good for our purposes. Uh, let's see, we talked about noise rejection. Um, and let's see, um, uh, this is obviously communication wire. So, as you can see, most of the layout control and cab bus standards uh, that you know about are RS-485. In, in fact, LocoNet is also. I did not put it on here because as in everything LocoNet, the implementation is a little bit funky. But uh, if you really wanted, you could run it over Cat5 with you know, probably slightly better performance. Uh, but CMRI net is uh, uh, RS-485, ExpressNet, the old lens system that a bunch of the Europeans still use. Um, uh, NCE cab bus is RS-485. <clears throat> um, and, you know, again, be happy to offline get into this. This We're getting a little obscure on communication standards for, for what you guys need to know. Um, as a general rule, I would try and keep the low voltage logic and signal stuff away from the power and DCC track, just to keep the noise from the big stuff out of the little stuff. Um, I do that by pull, uh, putting this stuff right behind the fascia because that's where the control panels are. It's usually a little closer to most of the things you're going to switch a lot. We try to usually design our layouts to make the stuff we need to reach close. Uh, and then I put the big stuff in the back up against the wall or the center of the peninsula. So that's an interesting wiring planning thing. Another kind of structured approach so that you can have a bundle of low voltage wire up front and then another bundle of, of nasty stuff in the back. Um, let's see here. Um, well, that's kind of the, 
key here because I just wanted to drill down on some stuff that uh, Phil was discussing last week from the Pleasanton Club. Um, but, uh, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, get into detail, um, I think you guys all know where I am. Um, Phil's pretty uh, visible too. Um, we'll make every effort to, you know, help you be successful with this. And uh, I, it's, it's generally just doing it the easy way. And that's my website. You can find all the, the little goodies under the accessories tab. Um, so slash accessories. Questions? Anybody still awake? Yeah, this is uh, kind of timely for me. I'm helping a, a friend of mine who is, uh, he's a techie from Google, project manager. He's building a modular sectional combination in scale layout. And we're trying to work out uh, what to do for the wiring. Uh, he hasn't got much, hasn't gotten very far yet. We're still in building bench work and planning. But the big problem for him, I wouldn't call it a problem, it's a challenge. He's totally blind. So he's running DCC with sound, NCE system, and he kind of follows the trains by sound. And he's got some programming already that he set up temporarily with his Unitrack where he can uh, have a train stop and uh, cross over another one into a station platform and so forth. But the whole basic thing of setting up uh, a wiring system for the, the layout, and it looks like the Cat5 might be an answer for him too because it'd make him easy easy for him to get the connectors together across the interfaces and so forth too. So you may be getting a, a call from me. Oh, absolutely, Paul. Another, another alternative, um, which is not very different. Uh, talk to um, Steve Williams with the Fremo N group. I think. You yes, know. he's already in contact with Steve and Steve also mentioned your name. Yeah. So, well, that's very good. So uh, we're, you know, we, we obviously we're in cahoots, but. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, so one of the things Seth said that's a really interesting thought process is you start thinking about like a modular kind of laying a railroad eyes. If you take an area, if you have a layout that you think of four blocks, and let's say it's in a room that's 30 by 20, so you've got these four blocks of the rail that runs around the room, you can take each of those blocks and consider it as an area and pull everything back to one point for these punch down panels. And then you can go buy on eBay for $25, a 50 foot, 25 pair cable. And you buy three of those and you plug them into the, at this end and you run those three cables to the center location and you've taken a quarter of your railroad and done all the wiring in three cables you plugged in in two minutes. And yeah. it, it's literally, it, it, so the whole thing is if you take this thought process that because Seth and I both done this. I mean, this is basically what I did for half my life was built the stuff that runs on this. And there's a way of thinking about that is if we apply it to model railroading, the beauty of it is, you know, you look at a wire anywhere on your layout, you know exactly where that wire goes on the other end because the structured wiring tells you where it ends up. And see, that's the problem is I'm building a building with, I'm building a 50 story office building and each floor has 300 offices on it. And I've got to know where this wire goes because Bob's complaining his computer doesn't work. That's why this structured wiring, the documentation, the structured side is more, not so much about the wire, it's about the documentation. And by the way, what I've found on virtually every layout I've ever looked under is it wasn't documented. I mean, the ones that are most of the ones that are built. And part of it was that we just went at it and wired it. The beauty of this is the products actually make you think through the hygienic wiring assessed that that's what gets me so excited about it because i think that's one of the biggest problems in having reliability in railroads is is the we do great work but it's it's so it's randomized and this makes you be very structured anyway enough said yeah i mean that's the pitch wiring hygiene it's all about wiring hygiene uh, once you do that, you know where things are, you know how it's supposed to work. It's very easy to isolate the faulty unit and either wire around it or replace it. So, you know, works great, easy for, I mean, we don't have as many moves, adds, and changes on a railroad as we would in the office phone system or, or, or data network, but uh, all of those things lead to easier maintenance. Yeah.